Hello, fellow Rebel Capitals. Hope you're well. I'm here with my good buddy, Kenny McElroy, and we are going to get into some commercial real estate. Now, Kenny is an expert. In fact, Kenny, why don't you give him a short kind of Reader's Digest version of your backstory to get everyone up to speed so they understand how you got your finger on the pulse of what's happening with this commercial bank or excuse me, commercial real estate crisis. Yeah, of course. Thanks, George. Yeah. So I started in multifamily in college, started buying them uh, in my 20s. And now since we bought uh, and sold three billions, we, we currently own two billion of mostly multifamily. But through all that history, George, I've done self storage, land development, office, you, you know, all kinds of stuff, retail. And, and, and I think, uh, you, you know, so now we're just closely monitoring, obviously all these loan problems and, the uh, and the work from home issues, which, which again is just going to repurpose existing real estate as it has. And as it always will. How many tenants do you have? We have about 10,000 tenants right now. And, um, you know, and that's a whole nother topic. I mean, yeah, well, I mean, what are you seeing there as far as your tenants oh, ability to man. pay rent and your it's, ability to increase uh, it's tough. prices? The, it's, it, it's, it breaks my heart. I, I mean, they're, you know, the, the, the rentals are supposed to be a spot for people to go to build credit, to buy a home. That's right. the progression. That's the way the system's supposed to be. What's happening now is people are ramping up their credit cards there's all kinds of companies uh, preying on them. So even Apple, Apple has Apple Pay, but now they have Apple Pay, comma, later. Like, I don't wow. know if you know that. Like I it's, did not. So it's like yeah. a layaway program. Huh. Yeah. You know, so so that's what's happening. There's there's companies that are actually paying me rent and and then going and, and letting the, the resident, um, you know, finance it. So you're kidding me. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's we just did. Wow, a video. We just I didn't did know. So, so let, let's just stop, stop right, stop right there for a moment. So if I can't pay rent, I'm basically going to a place that does payday loans. Yep. And saying, hey, can you pay Kenny for me? I can't afford that fifteen hundred dollar rent payment. And they're saying, fine, but we're gonna have you're gonna have to pay us back next month, and we're gonna charge you twenty five percent interest. And people yeah. are doing it. Yeah. And I don't know if those are all the terms, but yes, that's exactly there. The never before have we had a company come in in between the tenant and us, you know, typically the tenant, um, uh, you know, the last thing we want to do, George is evict people. Right. I mean, that is not fun. It's not the whole point. You know, it's not why we're in the business. It, yeah, and it's a huge it, cost to get in another tenant. Yep. So it's way yeah. cheaper. It, it's like, it, is it more costly for you to get a new customer or retain a current oh, customer? Oh, yes. A it, lot it goes more. Back to that. Yeah, a lot more. But also, you know, these people, when they rent to us, or we rent to them, I should say, we know that they have a application. We know where they work. We know their credit. So we're not renting to people that can't afford it. We're renting the people that want to be there and they want to pay and they understand what the rent is all before they move in. So, so, yeah, you know, right. so all, all we're trying to do is just be like a placeholder for the next step. And uh, so we're starting to see the underpinning uh, road, the, the consumer, at least in our company and my friends, uh, you, you, the consumer is, is getting, uh, pulled down. They're, they're getting pulled down from high interest rate credit cards. They're getting pulled down from autos, you know, the, the car, the car loans, they're getting pulled down from inflation and, and the food costs and the, and the gas and, and the energy and all that stuff. It's, it's, it's crazy. Um, what's happening. They're maxing out their credit card because of everything that you just said, but then when they can't get another credit card, then they go to this other entity, which is effectively the exact same thing. Yeah. Say, hey, can I just take out this rent credit card or Kenny McElroy credit card so I can pay uh, MC Properties rent and then I'll pay you the 22%. And it's got to be a huge interest rate, Kenny, because that's obviously an unsecured loan. It is. Like a credit yep. card or anything else. So, so yep. my point is they've maxed out their credit cards and now they're having to finance rent which is basically just adding more to that high interest debt burden they already have. Yeah. And really what they're doing is the, 
a lot of times, obviously, when rents do, let's say on the first of the month, let's say it's fifteen hundred dollars. What they're allowing them to do is pay weekly. So that's kind of the first step. So right. in other words, they can finance, you know, you know, four hundred and let's call it four hundred fifty dollars, I guess, uh, per week. And so a lot of people, as you know, are working that way. Their money comes in in different tranches. And so it allows them to pay four fifty dollars a week instead of $1,500. Actually, it's a little less than that, uh, four fifty a week. But uh, the, the $1,500 a month, they, they can actually pay by week. And so I don't really want it. I'm not in that game. So, so there's a company that they go to. We get the full $1,500 and, and then they figure yeah, out the balance. Yeah. Wow. All right. So that is a topic for a completely separate video. Let's yeah. get back to the, <laughs> the commercial real estate stuff. Uh, although I guess that would apply to the banks as well, because those same people that are having to take out a loan to pay their rent are people that probably owe the bank, possibly a regional bank money as well, which would be an asset on the regional bank's balance sheet, just like a loan to an investor to buy one of these properties, it's plummeting in value. Yeah. The interesting thing is, is like even Apple pay later, like that doesn't show up on credit reports yet. Mm -hmm. So there's a, if you look, there's a whole bunch of chatter about whether it should be on the bureau or not, because essentially I'm getting paid. They, we, you know, they, they've uh, outsourced the obligation to a third party and that third party isn't actually reporting that. So, so it's actually worse than most people think. That's a great point. Yeah, I mean that you would think that would go or that should go on their credit report because basically what they're doing is they say, they're saying I would have defaulted if not for getting this payday loan. Yep. Like on and, a regular and the probability that they default on that pay on that payday loan is is even greater. Yes, right. Because uh, to your point, uh, the, typically those they're not doing it, uh, you, you know, for anything other than profit. So they're they're financing that as well. Yeah. Okay. So going back to commercial real estate, I want to pull up a property, and we're not going to say where this property is, but this is something that came across your desk the other day, and I think the asking price now is what what was it roughly. It, it was about seven and a half million dollars. And, and it's important to understand that I, I get deals like this every day. I, I get 10 to 20 deals a day, perhaps even more. And, you know, I, this is not unusual for me to see something like this. It's it's not at all uh, surprising. It, it, what's what's happening is when the you know, obviously, when everyone got sent home and the pandemic and all of that work from home changed. And people decided, a lot of people, I don't want to go back to the office. And a lot of employers said, well, we don't really need offices. And so we don't really want employees to go back to the offices. So whatever side of the fence you're on, it's irrelevant. The point is the office building market changed a lot. And there are <laughs> lots and lots and lots of vacancies as a result of that. Yeah. And I, I think obviously that's going to get worse if we go into a recession. But what people need to realize, the building that's priced at, let's just say, $7 million right now that Kenny took a pass on, we're going to show you this building, just, what, Kenny, five years ago, it was sold for $30, in the $40 30s. million? Dollars? Yeah, in the 30s. So I'll just give you history. So the, the building's 117,000 you know, square feet, I, I think. And so that's a large office building. So everybody's come into this building. This could be office. It could be medical. It could be whatever. Like people have been in these buildings all the time. You pull up to them, you walk in, there's a bank of elevators to your right and your left. You go right. up, you find whatever, and you leave. Well, this building is currently 100% vacant. So, Jeez. so the, at some point, obviously it was built. And then at some point it's been sold. And so you know, let's just say that, um, you know, there was, 20 million dollars of debt on it uh, it's the same model you know the the building was sold for in the 30s there's some bank put 20 on it and the rest is equity that's a very typical real estate transaction you got the the equity and you've got the debt the problem is is as more and more people moved out 
it became vacant. And when when you start to when when the when people let's say one floor, let's four floors, first floor moves out, let's say now you got 75 percent of the of the income. Second floor moves out. Now you got 50 percent of the income, you know, and on and on and on until zero. <laughs> So what does zero pay? Nothing, right? It pays no utilities. It pays no property taxes, pays no insurance. It pays nothing. It can't pay the mortgage and certainly it can't pay back investors. So now you have this physical asset sitting in the middle of an area and these are happening everywhere. This is not a one uh, off situation. This is not unique. And, and so now you're looking at this piece of land and, uh, the owner, because there's still an owner, remember, now it could be the bank. Yeah, I was going to say, but now it's the bank that lent the $20 million that's going to get maximum $7 million back, and they're going to take a $13 million haircut. If they even get seven. That, that's, you know, and that's best case scenario. Yep. And I don't think they will, because don't forget, like a guy like me, uh, the way it's being marketed, and that's why I got it, is this is a multifamily redevelopment. So mm. let's go in and, you know, renovate this thing and turn it into apartments, which is kind of the buzz going on right now. You, you know, and I, I, I just looked at the, the, this thing and laughed. I don't know about you, George, but I don't really want to live in, let's say, less than a thousand feet in the United States. OK, so if that's just the case, the most you're going to get is about 100 units in this thing. And so I wouldn't even lift my finger for a 100 unit apartment building, you know, like it just doesn't make any sense financially to go all through all this work and only get a hundred units out of it. Cause on that same site, I could build 200, you know, for, yeah. <laughs> Oops, excuse me. Um, yeah. So I could build, if I was to rip it down, I could build more than double that. Yeah. So I think what people <laughs> need to understand is it gets to a point where you quite literally would not accept the property for free because the cost in renovating it and turning it into these apartment complexes would be the same cost that you would have to buy a piece of land and build it from scratch. In fact, it, you'd probably be able to do it cheaper at 100 doors. You could probably do 200 doors at the exact same price as it would for you to do this whole entire renovation and turn it from office into multifamily. So guys like you are looking at this saying, I, I wouldn't even take it if you gave it to me. Correct. Uh, because then I'd have the liability of the property taxes and it would be more expensive than to just go out there and buy a property and do it from scratch. Yeah. And, and let me give you another couple set of factors that are really drive it home. It, it's less than seven acres. And so they're asking, let's say seven million, seven and a half million. Okay. That's a million dollars an acre. <laughs> like, like you would never pay anything close to that. In give this me location. an example, Kenny. What are you paying for an acre right now? Oh gosh, maybe three or four hundred thousand. Okay, got it. Yeah, and, and of course it depends on the area. And there, there's a whole bunch of factors on. Obviously, you're going to pay more for land downtown rural um, than you you are you know, downtown urban instead of rural. Let's say, but a million dollars an acre is a lot for multifamily land. So you have to calculate that back into whatever the construction costs are going to be. The the other piece. George is you have to demo, you have to demo it. There you go. Yeah. So before you go there, Kenny, let me show a picture of this building. So people okay. know what we're talking about. This is not a dilapidated building. This is no. not a building that looks like it was built in the 1940s or something like that. And uh, this is a, a great looking building. Uh, here we go. Josh will do the screen share. So uh, look modern. I mean, you've got all the infrastructure, the AC that oh, it looks like a brand new roof. I mean, this is a fantastic looking setup. And then while Kenny, you can go ahead and explain this. And what I want the viewer to try to think through is how much it would cost to demo this thing <laughs> and clear that out well, and the permits and everything. I just want to, yeah, My I just want to, goodness gracious. I, I know. I just want to point out to everybody, you know, like it's, just, this is, this is not going to be a unique scenario. One off it, yeah. these buildings are everywhere. And as as more and more and more people decide not to return to the office and more employers decide that they don't need that much space, you're going to see more and more and more of this. So this, the problem is, is this use of this building is only really office. 
And, you know, if you convert it, you, you're not going to convert it to apartments. You, you, let's just don't forget that people don't want to just move into an office building just because you bought it and decided it <laughs> used to be an apartment building. Like, I mean, look, it, it doesn't have a pool. It doesn't have, a, you know, like all these things that it needs. Right. right? There's just so it's not gated. And you don't uh, have windows on one side. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And by the way, you can't even open them. Like, you're like yeah, yeah who, who could open an office building? window right like you know you got a common bathroom near the near the elevators you know, there's just so many mis problems you, you just can this is not a conversion it's a full tear down and a demo you know it's millions of dollars to demo so if you paid seven your basis in the land is going to be at least 10 mm, yeah and don't forget this is all personal cash you have to then convince somebody the city the county um, of whatever concept that you want to do, you, you know, and, 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 you know, that's a whole process too. That could take years because a lot of times these neighbors, neighborhoods don't want multifamily sitting in there and, and cause it's zoned right now. Or right they don't in, want a construction site for the next correct. five years, right next to them making noise. Yeah. And it's zoned also office. So there's that, <laughs> you know, like, so you can't just, decide it's going to be multifamily because it's zoned to office and that's kind of the point of zoning and uh so you have to get that changed so you have to get the zoning changed and you have to uh, you have to paint a picture and a vision for somebody to finance it a bank and equity and the whole thing and you know we haven't even gotten into the location you know the reason i passed actually believe it or not was it's in a pretty bad location um mm -hmm. and the irony George is that across the freeway is a failing mall. So mm -hmm. like within a quarter mile, and this is a mall that was built years ago. And you, you guys all know JC Penney's Macy's Sears, Kmart, just bed and bath and beyond line them up. They're yeah, gone. Right. Yeah. They're gone. Those. So these malls are dying too. So that, so across the freeway, you have this mall that's basically dying and, and they have like 2,300 units planned there. So, so now all of a sudden I'm looking at it, I'm like, well, and the, you know, the broker's like, oh, this is a good thing. You know, I'm like, it's not a good thing to have 3,000 more units in a, in a market of a quarter mile. Multi-family units. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and, and not to mention the fact that, you know, let's just put it this way. You, you, you wouldn't take your girlfriend there for a date. You like it's not. Yeah, you a, wouldn't take your kids to that area. After no, dark. no, no. You know, it's just it's it's rough. So you got all of those things that um, you you can't just take an old sled, beat up sled, rip it down and and put something up brand new and beautiful and shiny. You know, people people understand neighborhoods. They 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 can see things and and so you know the location is is uh, very very important and this is not a good one. Kenny, what do you think about the shadow inventory? I've been hearing that a lot. Yeah, and what I mean bad. by that specifically is let's just assume this building had 50% occupancy. Yeah. But so, half of those people, their lease expires in the next year. And let's say 50% aren't going to come back. In fact, they don't even have workers going in right now. They're just paying the lease even though they don't need it. So you may think that building has a 50% occupancy rate. But you fast forward just a few months or a year, and it's really twenty or thirty percent. It's a great question. I, I was actually with a friend of mine last week that his uh, he had a a, a company, one in uh, a big company in Phoenix and L.A., and he's paying hundreds of thousands of dollars a month in rent, and all his company's basically done, and um, you know the pandemic kind of put them out of business, but he's mm. still legally obligated to pay on those leases. Right. Probably got a personal guarantee on it. Yes. And so that's the shadow vacancy. So what it is, uh, is, is Dave is still paying each and every month, the rent on those assets. Cause when you, when you uh, uh, lease a property, you're, you're actually signing a lease personally for your company. When your company goes out of business, you're still obligated to pay that. Um, and there's people fighting that. And I understand all that's going on. But the point is the landlord would consider that occupied. Yeah, that's, right. that's the point. So, so in Dave's case, he's paying rent. 
is. And the landlord's seeing that on the rent roll and they're saying it's occupied. <laughs> Meanwhile, there's no company. Um, and so that's the shadow. That's what's called shadow inventory. And, and essentially that will all work itself out at the end of the lease. And there's millions and millions and millions of square foot that um, are still working its way through the system. See, these office leases can be five, six, seven, eight, ten 10 years. Mm -hmm. And if, if uh, I know I went into a high rise recently and um, I remember uh, one of the tenants was DoorDash, if you remember, you know, and, oh, yeah. uh, and I, we got off on the floor and it was all these desks with, with computer monitors, with, with, um, with this visqueen over it, this plastic over all the desk, it was 100% uh, nobody in there. And it was almost half of the floor. And so as those companies start to renew their leases, they're obviously not going to renew that. And so that's the shadow vacancy. So you have vacancy, which is truly vacant. And then you have shadow vacancy, which are, are companies are going to not renew or change the, the size that they want later. Yeah. Or they're going to renegotiate. I mean, why on earth? If you, you, It's not like you're some sort of idiot that can't see what's happening around you. And what I mean by that is if you're a tenant in one of these buildings and the building, let's say, has capacity for 100 tenants and you're down to two and one of them is you, when you go to renew your lease, even if you want to, you're going to be like, hey, I, I've got the landlord by the balls. Like I can basically name my price because <laughs> he yeah. can't get anyone else in here. So if I'm paying whatever, let's just say $5 a square foot, hell no, I'm going to renegotiate for a dollar a square foot. And that's even if I stay. Yeah. I, I think the, the greatest example of that right now, that's very public on the internet is Elon Musk. So, oh, there so you go. Right. We know that he reduced Twitter by what? 75% of workforce or something. Let's just, let's just use that. Well, that means he also reduced his office space need by the same amount. And so I know uh, there's several stories out there. And I talked to a couple of brokers that are in San Francisco and he's just like, I'm not paying you. Period. Now, yeah. the landlord's going to just list it as occupied <laughs> because, you know, occupied, not paid is different than vacant. Uh, but anyway, you know, so there he's like negotiating with Musk uh, over space he doesn't need. And so pennies on the dollar, whatever, whatever it is. But that landlord is reliant on that money coming in to be able to pay the bank. And that's exactly what happened in this particular case. Yeah. And the end of the day, the bag holder is the bank. Correct. That's yeah. what we got to remember. Yeah. And the bank, of course, is typically sits on that collateral. So that collateral is supposed to pay back the loan, right? That's why that's how loan to value works. So in this particular case, if they loan, let's say 20 million bucks against a $30 million of value, um, once they get down to about, let's say 30% vacant, they're in a little bit of trouble. The banks now, you know, and so that's what happened. The bank steps in and said, what's going on. But when you're at hundred percent vacant, it's pretty clear. <laughs> There's no money coming in. There's nobody getting paid on anything. Yeah. But the bank is going to, they're likely going to have to take a hundred percent loss on that. And just think uh, how, the, think about the ripple effect. Let's just assume the bank can absorb that. Well, how does that, impact their future willingness to lend not just in that business but any business for that matter and that's why in my opinion you see bank credit you look at a fred chart and it's pretty much flat when historically it's always trending upward uh, along with the economy so you can sit there and talk about five percent nominal gdp growth all you want but i don't know how that's sustainable if the banks are pulling back to the degree to which would cause bank lending to decrease, which is likely what we'll see moving forward. Yeah, well, we're seeing it now, as you know, we do a lot of multifamily deals and you know, we're seeing 50 to 55% loan to value. So the banks have already pulled back and they haven't even yet experienced some of these losses that are coming. It's, they, you know, they're, they're anticipating it. So we're mm -hmm. starting to see it now we would have seen 70%, let's say 75% uh, loan of value just a couple of years ago. Now, now they're in their fifties. And, right. and that's basically should tell you that banks are not going to lend as much. What that essentially means is 
they're giving you 50% of a, on the debt side, you have to come up with 50% on the equity side, as opposed to say 75% on the debt side and 25% on the equity side. So, uh, there's, they're, they're saying we, you need more capital up front, which is also a problem because, uh, you, you know, everything's heading the wrong direction. There's, there's not more equity to, to be able to put down. Yeah. And this is why we say, be careful about what you wish for in terms of low interest rates, right? Because low interest rates don't necessarily mean that money is available or, uh, you, you know, you've got free money out there uh, or money is loose. No, no, no. If you have low interest rates, most of the time, that's because you're living in an environment where money is tight. Uh, money is extremely tight, regardless of the interest rate, to your point, because the banks are saying, okay, fine, we'll lend, let's say the Fed drops rates, fine, we'll lend at 1%, but you're going to have to come up with 80% of the equity. <laughs> We're only going to give you 20% yeah. LTV, and it comes with all these stipulations and yada, yada, yada. So the net result is they're actually creating less money uh, by lending it into existence with low interest rates. That's right. And, and you know, you don't just have to look at it in a real estate. We saw this with cars. You know, when, when interest rates went down, car prices went up. Now car prices are down. Same thing happened with real estate. You know, uh, price of real estate went up. Uh, interest rates went up. Then price of real estate's coming down. So it's the exact same thing. Yeah. That lag effect takes time to work through the system. So, uh, Kenny, what, when do you think you'll start to see the opportunity? Because, you know, one thing I'm a firm believer in, whatever's the most, whatever would be the hardest thing to pull the trigger on right now is probably the number one thing that should be on your watch list. So we're looking at this disaster, this collapse, this crisis in commercial real estate. But what that would tell me is that should be on my watch list of things that I may want to purchase in the future because there could be an incredible opportunity there. So how do you reconcile these two things at the same time? The price is collapsing and you don't want to catch a falling knife while at the exact same time you want to take advantage of an opportunity that no one else is willing to even look at. Well, there's a bunch of things to consider. You know, I always say like, well, how do you know you're in a bad relationship? You know, it, it takes a while. Um, and, and I was like, well, sometimes you know, it doesn't. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Sometimes it doesn't. But you know, what happens is like, you think about the process, the, the building owner is in denial. They're trying to rent it, trying to rent it, trying to rent it slowly. It's a death of a thousand cuts. Now, if they're experienced, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're hedging immediately. And, uh, but if they're not, it's just slowly erodes, um, depends on the bank. Um, then eventually of course, this thing lands in the bank. This one, this particular property happens to be in bankruptcy just to complicate it a little bit more, you know, mm -hmm. you might as well throw that on top of it. So you have all of those things. And what happens, George is the bank now, cause I've been through this with the banks, they actually have a fiduciary obligation to their shareholder. Right. So they have to go out and get a, an a appraisal. What's this thing worth today? Um, vacant. Now, the irony is at this point, think of this. It may not show a loss on the bank's books at this point. That's very interesting. So let's say they have a $20 million loan. It's going to show as an asset of 20 million on their bank, right? Yeah. Now it's, they already know that it's being listed for seven, let's say, okay. So they've already gone through this process, Yeah. yeah. but they haven't actually written it down yet. And so, yeah. um, and then, so what has to happen is it, as there's appraisal, it goes out to bid like it's like it is now, people are looking at it, bidding on it. And there's a whole process there. And then it'll settle out based on whatever it settles out at. Maybe it, maybe, maybe somebody buys it at seven. I'd be, I, I find that hard to believe, but they could. And, and then now then they would have to take that $13 million right down. So there's a process, um, a, a, that, that has to happen. And that could take a while, you know, uh, from, from the time there's distress, it could take years. Right. Yeah. And they could be waiting for the fed to drop rates because they're under the illusion that somehow that'll make things better. 
without realizing that that's an environment where things are actually worse. I mean, Definitely. you could have, you know what I'm saying? Like your your yep. bank manager there, who's ever in charge, they could be saying, "Well, you know, we're booking that on the balance sheet right now at 20 million. If we do sell, we're probably going to have to write that down to five or ten, whatever. But if we don't sell, let's just hang on a little bit because the market's predicting that the Fed is going to drop rates this year. And if the Fed is dropping rates this year, then the cap rates are going to go down, and magically we're going to reaccelerate the economy. They're going to have more tenants in this building, and therefore we kind of dodge a bullet. So I, I think you've probably got that dynamic going on as well. You could, yeah. It, again, it's going to depend on the bank. You, you know, the bigger banks, believe it or not, are much much more difficult to to navigate. Uh, you know, it's like it's like trying to navigate the the U S government, you know, like yeah. anything you do with them is 10 times harder. So, you know, there's multiple departments and multiple decision makers and all that kind of stuff. But I think it's interesting. And in, back in 08, I'll say uh, it might've been 2010. I had a bank approach me and they were going to give me, listen to this, give me 200 units in Arlington, Texas. Hmm. Uh, so of course you got to go, Hmm. Why would a bank give me this for free? <laughs> because they're nice, Kenny. <laughs> yeah, okay. So I'm like, okay, so, okay. So I, we jump in, you know, because my business. So I figure that, so I, I can't remember, I'm going off a of memory, but let's say it's 10 million bucks and something, which is super cheap. Well, then there was 10 million plus, maybe another three or four to fix it, right? Because it was vacant, had all these problems, just like this. So now I'm like, okay, 10 million plus three. And so you have to, you have to solve to the end. Like, Am I just, am I taking somebody else's falling knife? You know, like, yeah, am yeah. I, am I, you know, is it really worth me taking it off of their hands? Because what they're trying to do is it's like the end of the game at Monopoly, right? Like here, you take this. It, I know it's full of debt. Um, you have to figure it out. It's not now not on my balance sheet anymore. I'm going to move it to yours. And, and so I, we passed because we felt like the free property plus the renovations uh, did not support the value of the market. Yeah, and yeah. what the bank was trying to do was hedge that and not have to report that. And so there's all kinds of games that will be played at this juncture on these assets. But this particular, I don't even think, you know, think about this. It's, it's not even financeable. Like yeah. there's, the, you know, when, when somebody gives you, uh, an interest rate and, and a loan on something, it's almost always because there's income coming in. <laughs> like they're going to, so, there's cash so flow, right? yeah. So a hundred percent vacant building is not even financeable. Yeah, that's all right. Well, we're going to have to wait and see how this is uh, playing out. I just absolutely love talking to you, Kenny, because we can get those insights. It's one thing to watch CNBC or Bloomberg or the wall street journal and hear about this stuff, but it's something altogether different talking to an insider who actually is in the trenches living this stuff every single day and uh, i really want to pay attention to what's going on with the basically the consumer loans yeah for people being able to bridge the gap with just making their monthly rent payment and they're having to pay 25 percent interest just to do that. that that's a whole other can of worms there but uh let's talk about rebel capital live you're going to be there it's going to be may 31st through oh, june yeah. 2nd um super stoked in fact we can go over and look at a group of speakers now if you look at the final row of speakers you would think the only people i've invited are bald as though that's some <laughs> sort of prerequisite I, in fact i just noticed that when we added ivor <laughs> i said Wow, it looks like it's a it's a convention for bald guys or something. <laughs> but no, Kenny McElroy is going to be there, and he does in fact have hair. Oh, look uh, at that! <laughs> and Snyder's got a lot of hair now. What is going on with Snyder? <laughs> uh, so, Kenny, what do you think is going to happen between now and uh, May? I mean, do you think we're going to see some progression with the banks, or just maybe on the tenant side? Well, I think the you know obviously the the banking sector is just they're they're in the first few innings, George. Of yeah, of right. Bank, uh, you, you know they, they don't even know yet like what's what's coming at them. So I think it's a great time to have rebel capitalists. I'm going to bring all this stuff. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna bring all kinds of kind of behind the scenes stuff that we talked about today to rebel capitalists, so people can kind of see what I'm seeing. You know. 
what are yeah, our do, do so with your tenants too if i yep. just make a personal request what that can, insider yep. intel you've got with the tenants not yep. just with the banks uh let's talk about that at rebel capitals live as well yeah for sure that, that that's that's really where it's at what is what's going on with the consumer yeah you know what are they feeling and 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 we did a, a youtube on that with uh with the head of our director of our management company uh shannon and it, it's got five Five hundred thousand views in in two weeks because you, you, they're like ah I want to I want to hear this and and, and you, that's really you know what's going on with with uh, retail well, you know because Amazon has gobbled up that and you, you know these small mom and pops are getting getting pounded what's going on with malls what's going on with commercial office you know where's multifamily headed you, you know those are big big things that are you know, everybody's so focused on. Well, house prices in my area are, are the same. Yeah, right, right. That's not a barometer. You, you know what's really, really for the overall economy, but, right? Yeah, not at all. Okay, well, guys, uh, get your tickets ASAP. The faster you get them, the cheaper they are. They go up in price as we get closer to the event. And this is an event you are not going to want to miss. That's for sure. Uh, Kenny, how can people watch more of your videos? Go to Kenny McElroy on YouTube. Yeah, you got it. M C E L R O I. And, uh, you know, you, uh, I just keep pumping this stuff out. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, make sure you tell Kiyosaki hi for me. I will. I will. I will, <laughs> I will for sure. In a, in a while. So enjoy your day, Kenny. Thanks for coming on. Okay, bud. See ya.